Welcome to Distinctive Landscapes End of Unit Summary for Geography with me, Mrs Shuttleworth. Having a look at the specification, you can see very clearly that you need to look at what makes a landscape distinctive and what influences the landscape specifically of the UK. And we're going to look at those physical processes and also the characteristics of two places in the UK, reminding you that both of those case studies, the River Tees and Dorset, are separate videos on YouTube. So what does make a landscape distinctive? It comprises all the visible features of an area of land. It can contain both natural features and man-made features. Now, we know that the UK has a varied physical landscape as a relief of the land changes in different parts of the country. And each landscape is created by the interaction of natural and human factors. And the main elements of these are physical, like mountains, lakes and valleys, biological, like trees and grass, variable, those temporary characteristics like weather and seasons, and human, like buildings and other land uses. So where are they? Uplands, like our mountainous areas like the Grampians and the Pennines, are found mainly in the north and west, particularly Scotland, Wales and northern England. And the lowlands are including those flat and rolling landscapes like the Cotswolds and the South Downs. And these are mainly found in England, in the south and the east. And if you look at this map, you'll remember it from our lessons. You can see where the Grampians, the Pennines, the Cambrians and Dartmoor are located in the north and west and where the Cotswolds and the South Downs are located as our examples of lowlands. But we also looked at glaciated landscapes of the UK and the last ice age that took place here was about 18,000 years ago. You know that we're in the Holocene at the moment um, and that the Quaternary is 2.6 million years. And during this time, temperatures remained low throughout the year and ice sheets and glaciers covered the north of the UK and other parts of Europe around 18,000 years ago. And they can be found here north of the blue and the red lines. But our glaciated landscapes have particular physical landforms, which you can see summarized here. I would suggest that you try and recreate this. So you can see a U-shaped valley, a hanging valley, an erect um, pyramidal peaks also, which are not on there, um, tarns, horns, cirques, and lakes. See if you can recreate some of those. But what makes our landscape really distinctive? So our geology is really important and we know there are three different rock types. We have igneous rocks, which are cooled and solidified magma or lava. We've got sedimentary rocks that are formed by the deposition and cementation of sediment on the surface of the earth or in water. And we've got metamorphic rocks too. So existing rock types that are changed by heat or by pressure. Now we looked at two types. One was chalk, sedimentary rock, and we looked at its impact on the landscape. And we said that it's found in the South Downs. And we also got the White Cliffs of Dover. It's a type of limestone, a sedimentary rock formed in layers or strata on the street seabed. Later, the strata were folded and pushed up to form new land above sea level. It's made from calcium carbonate from the shells of tiny sea creatures that sank to the bottom of the ocean, and it forms these gentle rolling hills. The soil on this rock type is alkali, it's quite fertile and well drained, and it's ideal for growing grass and also suitable crops. Unlike other types of limestone, it's soft and crumbly, so it's easily weathered and eroded, and it's permeable too, so it allows the water to drain through you can use it to write on a blackboard. Granite, however, is igneous. This is found in the Coolins on the Isle of Skye in Scotland, also Dartmoor in Devon. And it's hard to believe really, isn't it, that Dartmoor used to be volcanic. It's an igneous rock found where molten rock cools down slowly below the Earth's surface. And because it cools slowly, the crystals are large. They're made from quartz, feldspars and mica and it often forms dramatic looking mountain landscapes. The soil on this rock type is acidic, not very fertile, 
Often it's waterlogged and so not good for growing crops. It's a very hard rock that weathers and erodes slowly. It can be used to make curbstones along roads and it's also impermeable, so water does not pass through it. It's a very hard rock used for making kitchen worktops. So what have we done, human beings, to our upland environments? We've built wind farms because they're really exposed on top of hills. And obviously we like to create um, wind energy. We use them for hunting. We use them for forestry. Coniferous trees grow on better well-drained land. We use them for hydroelectric power. We use them for farming and we use them for tourism too because people like walking they're beautiful environments but what have we done to lowlands it's very different um we've urbanized lowlands and obviously with that has become there has been um, increased flood risk as the land becomes impermeable it also increases water air and soil pollution roads increase traffic flow which increases the visual noise and pollution impacts of the area Housing is popular on lowland areas as it's easier to build on than uplands and obviously construction leads to higher population densities and requirements of services like schools. Industry varies in lowland areas, can include retail or manufacturing. You've got arable crops taking up a lot of space and requiring access by heavy machinery, which can be noisy. And dairy farmland reduces tree cover as the cattle need space to graze. Water pollution can be high if waste isn't disposed of properly. Now you've got three different agents of change. So these are these are the agents that are changing our landscape and having big impacts on it. So the first one is rivers. They flow by gravity over the land from their source to the sea. There are rivers all around the UK, but especially in the north and west where there's more rain. You also had glaciers. They were once covered much of the country like giant rivers of ice. Although there are no glaciers here now, they left their mark on the UK landscape and they're still at work in other countries obviously today. And the sea, it surrounds the whole of us, making us an island or a group of islands. Over the centuries, the sea has changed our coastline. And with that, there are lots of physical processes shaping our landscape. So the geomorphic processes that are involved include weathering, so mechanical, chemical, biological, mass movement, like sliding, slumping, erosion, abrasion, hydraulic action, attrition and solution, transport through traction, saltation, suspension and solution, and deposition. So weathering, we know, is the breakdown of rocks at the Earth's surface by the chemical action of rainwater, the mechanical extremes of temperature and biological ac activity. It does not involve the removal of rock material. Mechanical weathering is caused by temperature changes, especially on mountains. Large temperature variation between day and night leads to freeze-thaw weathering. Chemical weathering is when rainwater is naturally acidic. You've got the action of rainwater causing chemical weathering. Some rock types are more easily weathered. Limestone and chalk are both composed of calcium carbonate. They slowly dissolve in acid. And an example would be limestone pavement in Yorkshire, Madam Tartan. Biological weathering is caused by plants and animals. Tree roots can force their way into rocks, splitting them apart. Smaller plants like mosses grow on rocks, slowly making it crumble. And animals can burrow um, with their trampling feet as well. So examples of landscape types and the impact of weathering on them, as I've mentioned really quickly there, Malham in the Yorkshire Dales in Northern England, the rocks are smoothed by chemical weathering and the acid in rainwater dissolves the calcium carbonate in the rock. The Coolins, which is granite, the Isle of Skye, Western Scotland, they're subjected to freeze-thaw action, making them jagged where the cracks form and the rocks fall off. And the South Downs, which is chalk in Sussex. And chalk dissolves in rainwater over time, leading to these smooth rolling hills. Now, there are a few types of mass movement. The first one is rock fall, where bits of rock fall off the cliff face, usually due to freeze-thaw weathering. Mud flows is where saturated soil, the soil that's been filled with water, flows down a slope. And landslides, large blocks of rock slide down the hill and rotational slips. Saturated soil slumps down a curved surface. Now, we know that there are four different types of erosion, and we can see these operating at the coast and in, and in rivers. 
So attrition is when rocks are carried by water are reduced in size as they collide with each other. Abrasion is when the water throws sand and pebbles against the riverbank or the cliff, causing them to wear away. Hydraulic action is the sheer weight and impact of water. Air is trapped in cracks in the riverbank or the cliff. It's suddenly compressed by the force of the water, which increases the pressure on the land. Solution is the chemical action of water on the riverbank or the cliff, where minerals in the rocks and the soil are dissolved. There are also four types of transport. So we have bed load or traction. Boulders and pebbles are rolled along the riverbed or seabed at times of high discharge. And saltation, where you have smaller particles are bounced along the river or seabed by the flow of water. You have suspension, where fine clay and sand particles are carried along within the water, even at low discharges. And solution, some minerals dissolve in water like calcium carbonate, and this requires very little energy. So looking at transport, continuing with that theme, you will remember longshore drift, the zigzag motion of sediment being carried along a beach. So sediment is carried by the waves along the coast and it's called longshore drift. Waves we know approach the coast at an angle because of the direction of the prevailing wind. The swash carries the material towards the beach at an angle and the backwash flows back down at 90 degrees. And the process repeats itself along the coast in a zigzag motion. So all these processes combined to form either erosional landforms or depositional landforms. So headlands and bays. A headland is a narrow piece of land that protect, projects outwards from a coastline into the sea. Bays are broad inlets of the sea where the land curves inwards. Headlands are usually formed when the ocean attacks a part of the coastline with alternating bands of hard and soft rock. Bays form where there's less resistant rock, like sands and clays are eroded, leaving bands of stronger or more resistant rocks like chalk, limestone and granite, which form a headland or peninsula. Headlands form on coastlines like the Swanage Bay in Dorset. And you can see here, very simplified diagram of resistant and less resistant softer rock where you would find um, headlands and bays forming. On these headlands, erosion may occur and you can see here caves, arches, stacks and stumps commonly found on a headland. Cracks are formed in the headland through the erosional processes of hydraulic action and abrasion. As the waves continue to grind away at the crack, it begins to open up to form a cave and that becomes larger, breaks through to form an arch. The base of the arch continually becomes wider through further erosion until its roof collapses and leaves a stack behind. And then obviously that's undercut, collapses again to form a stump. Beaches are made up from eroded material that has been transported from elsewhere and then deposited by the sea. For this to occur, waves must have limited energy. So Beaches often form in sheltered areas like bays. Constructive waves build up those beaches as they have a strong swash and a weak backwash. Sandy beaches are usually found in bays where the water is shallow and the waves have less energy. Pebble beaches often form where cliffs are being eroded and where there are higher energy waves. A cross profile of a beach is called the beach profile and has lots of ridges called berms. They show the lines of the high tide and the storm tides. A sandy beach typically has a gentle sloping profile, whereas a shingle beach can be much steeper. The size of the material is larger at the top of the beach due to the high energy storm waves carrying that large sediment. And the smallest material is found nearest the water as the waves break here and break down the rock through attrition, that bashing together. Spits and tombolos are examples of depositional landforms. Longshore drift moves material along the coast. A spit forms when the material is deposited. Over time, the spit grows and develops a hook if wind direction changes further out. Waves cannot get past a spit, which creates a sheltered area behind it where silt is deposited and mud flats or salt marshes form. Here's a nice little diagram. You might wish to try and redraw this diagram showing that longshore drift and showing how it curves round, it hooks round due to the change in direction of um, wind. This is the example of Spurn Head. 
Now, in order to make our coastal environments um, habitable, perhaps for humans, um, we manage them. We know that erosion is a natural process which shapes cliffs and over time it can cause cliff collapse. Therefore, the coast needs to be managed. And hard engineering involves building artificial structures which try to control those natural processes. And each engineering, obviously, strategy has its advantages and disadvantages. The first one is sea walls. They're concrete walls that are placed at the foot of a cliff to prevent erosion. They're curved to reflect the energy back into the sea. They're effective at protecting the base of the cliff. And they usually have promenades so people can walk along them. You might have seen the one at Western. But the bad things about them, the disadvantages, the waves are still powerful and can break down and erode the sea wall. They're really expensive, about £2,000 a metre, and they don't look very nice, as you can see. The second one is rock armour, which are large boulders placed at the foot of the cliff. They break the waves and they absorb their energy. The good things about this is that they're cheaper and they're easy to maintain. They can be used for fishing too. But the disadvantage is they look different to the local geology as the rock has been imported from other areas. And they're really expensive to transport. As you can see, they stand out a little bit. Gabions are mesh cages that hold rocks and are placed in areas affected by erosion. They're cheap, about £100 a metre, and they absorb wave energy. And the disadvantages are, though, they're not very strong and they look unnatural. Groins are wooden or rock structures built at right angles out into the sea. The advantages are they build a beach which encourages tourism and they trap sediment being carried by longshore drift. But unfortunately there are disadvantages by trapping the sediment it starves beaches further down the coastline, increasing rates of erosion elsewhere and they don't look very nice either. So hard engineering involves using artificial structures whereas soft engineering is a more sustainable and natural approach to managing coastal erosion. It doesn't involve building artificial structures, but it takes a more sustainable and natural approach, and each strategy has advantages and disadvantages. So beach nourishment is when sand is pumped onto an existing beach to build it up. So it blends in with the existing beach, and larger beaches obviously appeal to tourists. But the disadvantages needs to be constantly replaced and the sand has to be brought in from elsewhere. And actually, it doesn't look very nice when it's being done. Beach reprofiling is when the sediment is redistributed from the lower part of the beach to the upper part of the beach. They do this in um, Lyme Regis. Advantages are cheap and simple, reduces the energy of the waves. At the disadvantages, it only works when wave energy is low and it needs to be repeated continuously. So we've looked at the coastal environment. We're going to move on to the rivers. So the formation of river landforms like waterfalls, gorges, V-shaped valleys, floodplains, levees, meanders and oxbow lakes. So a waterfall is a sudden drop along the river's course. It forms when there are horizontal bands of resistance, so harder rock, positioned over exposed, less resistant, softer rock. The soft rock is eroded quicker than the hard rock and it creates a step. <clears throat> As erosion continues, the hard rock is undercut, forming an overhang. Abrasion and hydraulic action continue to erode the soft rock to create a plunge pool, and over time this gets bigger, increasing the size of the overhang until the hard rock is no longer supported and it collapses. This process continues and the waterfall retreats upstream. A steep sided valley is left where the waterfall once was, which is called a gorge. And you can see that steep sided gorge there. And you can see the hard rock and the soft rock, the overhang and the waterfall retreating with a nice big plunge pool at the bottom. V-shaped valleys form with vertical erosion in the form of abrasion, hydraulic action and solution in the river channel, and this results in the formation of a steep sided valley. Over time, the sides of this valley are weakened by weathering processes and continued vertical erosion at the base of the valley. Gradually, mass movement of materials occurs down the valley sides, gradually creating a distinctive V shape. And this material is then gradually transported away by the river when there is enough energy to do so. There's your simplified diagram of the river eroding down the steep sides being weathered, 
the slope transport of that weathered material, leaving behind a V-shaped valley, which look like this. Pretty impressive. Next one, floodplain formation. So we've got this wide floodplain in the area around a river that's covered in times of flood. It's very fertile due to the rich alluvium deposited by floodwaters. It makes the floodplain a good place for agriculture. And every time the river floods its banks, it will deposit even more silt or alluvium on the floodplain. And a buildup of this on the banks can create levees which raise the riverbank. So levees are formed by repeated flooding of the river. When the river floods, the biggest, most coarse material will be dumped close to the riverbanks. And this will continue to build up the levee over time. So during a flood, water spills over and deposits the silt. And it does so because the surface area has suddenly increased. So therefore, the energy drops. In between floods, um, slow moving river deposits silt in the riverbed. And with each flood, the levees are built up. Next one is meander formation in the middle and the lower course of the river. So as the river makes its way to the middle course, it gains more energy and therefore, so more water and therefore more energy. Lateral erosion starts to widen the river. When the river flows over flatter land, it can develop these large bends called meanders. As the river goes around a bend, most of the water is pushed towards the outside. And this causes increased speed, increased erosion through hydraulic action and abrasion. A steep bank called a river cliff is created on the outside of the meander. The lateral erosion of the outside bend causes undercutting of the river cliff, leaving an overhanging bank. Water on the inner bend is slower, causing the water to deposit eroded material, creating a gentle slope of sand and shingle. The buildup of deposited sediment is known as a slip-off slope or sometimes a river beach. This is a cross section showing that slip-off slope and deposition, the slower current here, faster current on the outside of the bend with that river cliff really clearly visible. Now meanders sometimes form oxbow lakes. So due to the erosion on the outside of a bend and deposition on the inside, the shape of a meander will change over a period of time. Erosion narrows the neck of the land within the meander and as the process continues, the meander neck moves closer together. So when there's very high discharge of the river, usually during a flood, so there's more water in it, the river cuts across the neck, taking a new straighter and shorter route. Deposition will occur to cut off the original meander, leaving a horseshoe-shaped oxbow lake. And you can see that process in action here, erosion making that neck narrower, and during a flood, taking the shortest route, it breaks through and you can see the new straighter river course, leaving this abandoned, no flow, stagnant water, Oxbow Lake. Bringing you to um, a summary of this in our knowledge organiser, use this to have a look through those key ideas. Try and produce a nice revision clock or as you listen to my exciting video, you can create a mind map. There are so many resources available for you so that you can be a real great success at your Geography GCSE. The first one is a summary specification checklist. You can rag it um, to see where you feel most comfortable and where it requires extra work. You've got your key vocab list that you can go through. And obviously you have subscribed to the CVS Geography channel. Good luck with your revision. Well done, guys.